Hey folks, David Stewart here. Let's talk a little bit about exposition. Two different approaches to exposition, in fact, indirect exposition versus direct exposition, and how you're going to see them in both the literary world and in the cinematic world. Direct exposition, as you can guess, is where you're going to tell the audience directly whatever you need them to know. Uh, so if you open up the first page of The Hobbit, that's going to be direct exposition. In a hole, there lived a hobbit. Hobbits look like this. They have curly hair on top of their feet, They're shorter than dwarves. This is what their holes look like. They're not dank and damp. They have round doors and round windows and back end looks like this and all the windows face this way. Uh, that is gonna be direct exposition. Um, you're saying something right to the audience in really plain language. In fact, that's the way most books began, sort of most classic books begin with a certain amount of direct exposition before you get to the actual plot Ex, uh, uh, exposition and most books combine these techniques by the way if they're using direct exposition they will also use indirect exposition mixed in there uh, just depending on what needs to happen but that's not the only way that you can begin a book you can begin a book with what's called indirect exposition and you can use indirect exposition throughout a book and in fact the hobbit uses direct exposition throughout the entire book Indirect exposition is where you're just going to present a scene and with all the characters and the reader or the viewer, if it's a movie, they have to infer the details of the exposition through the action that they're watching. Uh, so you kind of synthesize the exposition. If you were to rewrite The Hobbit in an indirect fashion, uh, you would just begin with the first scene of maybe Bilbo and Gandalf talking and you'd have Bilbo look up at Gandalf above him and that would let you know that Bilbo is short. Uh, you'd have Gandalf duck through the round doors telling you that the doors are round and that Gandalf was tall. Uh, you might have, you know, Bilbo scratched the mat of curly hair on top of his feet. No, hobbits have big feet with curly hair, right? You'd, you'd figure this stuff out or you'd sprinkle the details in throughout the first scene. Uh, so that's the other way that you can do exposition. Now, one of those is way more popular now in modern literature than the other, and that's indirect exposition. Direct exposition is kind of fallen out of popularity over the last few decades, even though most classic literature begins with um, direct exposition. And I think there's a few reasons for this. I think some of it might be coming from like the academic area, like writing professors who are, are telling their students to uh, to always show and never tell or something like that, or never do direct exposition, uh, even though the books that they like have a lot of it. Um, <laughs> And I actually think it's not that, not just that anyway, but I think readers actually like indirect exposition to an extent because you can begin right with the action. And so that can be very gripping and very interesting to just begin with action and then kind of figure out things as, as you go. Um, the action can really hook you in. The other thing is readers and writers as well have been subjected to years of cinema experience. So I think cinema does influence literature in this case. Cinema is almost entirely indirect exposition. And there's a reason for that, is that uh, direct exposition is unnecessary in most cases. Why? Well, think about the, um, the direct exposition of The Hobbit. This is the way hobbits are. You don't need any of that if you can just show what a hobbit looks like. So because you have a visual medium, you can just show, here's a hobbit, he's smaller than this wizard, he has hair on his feet. You can just show all of that information. You don't have to um, tell the audience that kind of information for them to understand what's going on or what they should expect from hobbits. You can just show it. Uh, likewise, if you have a movie set in New York City, you don't have to describe New York City. You can just show it. If you have a, a setting in some futuristic city with crazy computers, you can just show the computer behind the character. You don't have to talk very much about it. Um, however, there are some big exceptions to this. Oddly, even though cinema is dominated by indirect exposition, there's some movies that begin with direct exposition or use direct exposition throughout in the form of narration or, you know, having a narrator kind of tell parts of the story that are missing along the way. Um, a really famous example is just Star Wars. Star Wars begins with that opening crawl. That's direct exposition. That's the way the movie begins. It tells you all the stuff you need to know. There's this Death Star, this evil empire. It gives you the critical pieces of information for you to understand the first scene. Now, you could skip the crawl and pretty much understand the movie eventually. But George Lucas really wanted to set that up so you had this idea of who was evil and who was good right from the get-go and you could figure out the heroes and the villains um, quickly and with ease and get into the action of the story. Another really famous example is actually the Lord of the Rings movies begin with direct exposition, not the direct exposition from the books, but a different kind. They 
talk about the history of the ring. You have Galadriel saying, you know, there were these rings of power and here's what they were given to. And the, you have some uh, assisted visuals of like dwarves and then there's a battle. The, you know, you show how the ring got lost by Isildur. All of that's direct exposition because it takes place before the story. Even though it's visual and you have a visual representation, you have a narrator telling you the important information you need to know. And all of that sets it up so everything's crystal clear for the audience when this story begins. And that's the big advantage of direct exposition is that you can be really, really clear and precise with your audience and they can, you can make sure that nobody gets lost along the way. If you're doing things indirectly, it may get confusing if you're not highly skilled at it. And there's a couple ways that you can actually put very slyly combine these two things. You pretty much you put in some direct exposition midway through the narrative in a way that people don't recognize it because you do it through dialogue. One of the ways that you can do it is a, a very famous trope in fantasy, what I call the Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur, King Arthur's Court trope, which is where you take someone from our world or somebody who's in a very unfamiliar world. And then they ask all the questions that you would ask as the audience and characters then tell them the answers, which is the exposition of the setting. So a really good example of this is actually not just not this. This is not really a fantasy novel, but this is kind of the, the setup that I see used all the time. A really, really good example. Now, there's lots. Oh, man, there's so many fantasy examples. But one that is probably not obvious is actually Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. Wheel of Time, very famous fantasy series. It's got like 13 books, and um, some of them are less good than others, in my opinion. But the way the, the books begin, all the protagonists are from this podunk village. They're from the two rivers, right? And this podunk village knows nothing about the outside world. They know virtually nothing. So when they are forced to leave, you know, there's a big action at the beginning, and then they have to leave. They end up having to ask questions along the way and have the characters tell them how the world is because they're so uh, they're so like out of the backwoods so it's like oh what are the I said I the I said I are this um, you know Ajas are this this is how this works this is how that works we're going here this was a city that was this you know there's there's a lot of telling to the to the characters because they don't know what's up and that's a way that you can kind of very slyly directly tell the audience but you're doing it just one little layer removed by having one character tell another character so this is somebody said in the comments like i was told to do all exposition through dialogue it's like you can do it that way that's a little setup that you can use to do it um, on the other side you have indirect exposition with none of that um, a really famous series the malazan book of the fallen by steven erickson um, in some cases you don't have a firm grasp of how certain things work in the universe till many books into the series because he he never tells you he just skips explaining things and just shows you the action just shows you the scenes and the characters and you are the are the as the audience member are spending time synthesizing uh all the rules of the universe and how the magic system works and he does this in in a lot of different ways when when you read gardens of the moon it opens up with mages like blasting this this thing called moonspawn and you're not quite sure even what moonspawn looks like and you don't even really know what it is until i think three or four books into the series you have an idea of finally what you i first thought it was like a floating castle and then later realized it's just it's not that um, but but you know you you figure it out as you go as details are revealed and you kind of figure out how the magic system works as details are revealed and um, they show you a little bit a couple things at the beginning of gardens of the moon to get the basics and then the deep stuff's revealed later on so that's a great example of indirect exposition however that's the big thing that keeps people from reading malazan is that it's really confusing uh, if you if you're not like a diehard and willing to read a deep into it to figure out what's going on so a lot of people read try to read Gardens of the Moon and they put it down because it's confusing and they don't feel like it makes sense or they don't like it. And um, that's that's the drawback of that. Because you are not able to be really super clear with the audience, it's not, it's not obvious what you're doing. So you can do either one. Um, now, the thing is, I've done both. <laughs> So in Muramasa, I actually begin an indirect exposition. Um, I have like a little, a little blurb of something that's written, which doesn't really explain much, but kind of piques your interest. Um, and it's just a little page that has 
uh, something that was written on a scroll. Then you have like an act one, and then you have chapter one, and uh, it begins with dialogue. What sort of man does this? The floor, it is ruined, right? And you're like, who's this guy? Who's he talking? Just start with the scene and you figure out the rest as it goes. And because it's set in feudal Japan, that's a that's a setting that most people don't need a whole ton of explanation to figure out. They need a little bit if you're not super familiar with uh, Japanese history, but um, I kind of give that as it goes. The The relevant stuff is, is sort of given as it goes. This book um, has a controversial beginning, I suppose. Some people didn't like the beginning of this book because it begins with direct exposition. Um, it begins with uh, Helga was. <laughs> Helga was a young woman grown from an impetuous and difficult to satisfy girl. Uh oh. Started with direct exposition. People are like, it starts like a fairy tale. It's like, well, that's it's direct exposition. I wanted it to be like classic fantasy. Now I could go back and, and take that feedback and revise that and get rid of that um, direct exposition. Um, but I don't know, I may want to keep it in there. I, I chose to do it because it kind of sets up all the relevant information for what ends up being the ending of the book and does it in a just a really obvious fashion. Um, in both of these books, I actually set up, I set up in the first chapter how the ending happens, <laughs> which, you know, I don't know if everybody figured it out with these or if I was like too subtle. Um, but that's, that's, I've done both and I'd say I've gotten more people objecting to the direct exposition in this book than I've gotten people ever be confused with the indirect exposition in this book. Most people are smart enough to figure out stuff as you go and you don't you probably don't need the uh, the direct exposition. This one is more contemporary. It begins with indirect exposition and in fact uses indirect exposition throughout the entire book with a couple of cases where you have to ask a character how something works, like I mentioned Connecticut Yankee kind of trope, um, because one character doesn't understand something. And that's a chance to, to deliver exposition through dialogue. Uh, so hopefully that's a, that's a little bit interesting. If you want a great example, a cinematic example of indirect exposition of the setting and characters and plot, the whole bit, very, very much in one scene, watch the beginning of The Godfather. Because that has, they don't tell you, oh, this is a mafia dawn. This is the way the mafia works. All of that's done completely indirectly in Francis Ford Coppola's movie. You have this first scene with this powerful Don, this guy asking a favor, someone getting married. You get that there's rules involved and you start to immediately understand the organization and that this guy's at the top. It tells you everything you need to know right from the beginning. We'll make him an offer he can't refuse. It's subtle, it works, and as the movie goes through, you never notice that you really needed any help figuring it out. It's really, really well done uh, opening scenes and throughout the movie uh, as well. So. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Um, Patreon is up, uh, patreon.com slash David V. Stewart. If you are a patron, you're going to get this book for a dollar. If you if you want to give me a buck a month, you'll have access to at least one book uh, changing every six to eight weeks. Um, it's going to be Muramasa for a while. If you are on the $5 level, my, my thought criminals, you'll actually have access to like my whole catalog. So if you want to read any of my books and you want to be a patron, the $5 level will give you access to all of them. So uh, have a great day. And if you enjoyed this or got some value out of it, please feel free to uh, like, comment, and subscribe or uh, drop me a buck on Patreon. I always do appreciate it. And I'll see you guys next time.